the Norman B. Leventhal Math and Education Center at the Boston Public Library, Library has over 200,000 maps in its collection, with over 9,000 digitized and available via its online collection portal. It provides research support to scholars and historians, teaches classes on mapping data with GIS platforms. It offers professional development to K through 12 educators, and in normal times, <laughs> presents map-based lessons to 4,000 students a year. It also curates and presents thematic ex exhibitions that explore how maps represent our world and the stories they tell. Today, Rachel Mead, the Public Engagement and Interpretation Coordinator, will give us an up-close and personal tour of its current online exhibit, Bending Lines, Maps and Data from Distortion to Deception and a collaborative and close look at a few historic maps of Holyoke. This presentation will leave you with many ways to explore your geographical interests. So please help me welcome Rachel Mead. So I'm going to um, share, oh, where is share? Share my screen with everybody so that you can see um, my PowerPoint. Not going to share sound because it sounded like a robot. And um, so I uh, thank you, Penny. I am the public engagement and interpretation coordinator at the MAP Center. Um, I am brand new at this position. So this is one of my first um, external uh, presentations that I'm giving. And I'm very excited to be here. Um, before I really get into the, uh, the meat of the presentation, I want to talk about um, where we are today. Um, I want to acknowledge before we begin that the land we live on and are discussing is unceded native territory. The MAP Center is on the Shama Peninsula and the region surrounding it is the current and ancestral home to indigenous peoples, including the Mashpee and Aquina Wampanoag tribes, the Nipmuc nations and descendants of the Massachusetts people. Today, I'm talking about land where all of you, or some of you, live, which is the Pecumtuck and Nipmuc land. Um, so there's a map of, of where you are right here, or many of you are. Um, these Algonquian language-speaking groups lived on this land in semi-sedentary patterns for thousands of years before Europeans and Euro-American settlers arrived. After King Philip's War and the import of European diseases, both the Pocomtuck and Nipmuc were po pushed out or fled um, the area where Holyoke now lies at the bend of the Connecticut River. The maps we're about to look at are maps that show property and land in a very different light from the way that they were treated up until European colonization. And most of them are produced during a time in which massive violent efforts at native land dispossession and genocide are taking place in other parts of the continent. So they show how colonialism is an ongoing process, which didn't end with dispossession of these groups, but continued through the 19th and 20th centuries to today. Nations and bands are still fighting for recognition and land rights from federal, state, and local American governments. Um, and today we recognize that the land I present from and from which you listen, many of you, is occupied territory and recognize as well the genocidal practices perpetrated in the name of that occupation. Many of the maps we have at the Leventhal Map Center were created for this project of colonialism, expansion, erasure, and dispossession. This is certainly true of the advertising and land use maps that we'll be looking at this afternoon. However, Native people remain on this territory and are stewards of the land as they have been for hundreds of generations. The Nipmuc have regained federal recognition and the Pocumtuk have been welcomed into related groups, including the Abenaki and Mohican tribes. So I actually recommend um, this website, native-land.ca, that I got these maps from. Um, it's a really excellent digital mapping project to start or develop your thinking about the way that cartographies of colonialism relate to your life and where you live. So hopefully um, this is you know, just a land acknowledgement. It's nothing more. Um, but I hope it becomes a seed for change in the ways that we interact both with the land and the native people to whom it belongs. So we're gonna pivot a little bit. Um, this is obviously still relevant as we go through the maps, um, but we're gonna start talking about 
um, the current exhibit that we have at the MAP Center, which is called Bending Lines, uh, Maps and Data from Distortion to Deception. It was supposed to be a physical exhibit that people could come to in person, um, but of course, because of the way um, our world has changed since, um, since we conceived of the project, it has become uh, an online exhibit and I can share the uh, link to it with you at the end. Um, but basically the idea is that because maps seem to show the world how it really is, they produce a powerful sense of trust and belief. Um, but maps and data visualizations can never communicate a truth without any perspective. Their social objects, their meaning and power are produced by written and symbolic language and their authority is determined by institutions and the contexts in which they circulate. So we are going to examine the many ways in which maps and data can bend the lines of reality. We expect maps to tell us the truth. They seem trustworthy after all. When you need to figure out how to get from Copley Square to Fenway Park, or if you're interested in comparing the income levels of Boston's neighborhoods, the first reference material you're likely to seek out is a map. But maps, truth, and belief have a complicated relationship with one another. Every map is a representation of reality, and every representation, no matter how accurate and honestly conceived, involves simplification, symbolization, and selective attention. Even when a map isn't actively trying to deceive its readers, uh, it still must reduce the complexity of the real world, emphasizing some features, hiding others, compressing the round globe onto a flat sheet of paper, and converting places, people, and statistics into symbols, lines, and colors is a process inherently fraught with distortion. Meanwhile, what we understand to be true is based on what we have seen in maps. For example, how do you know that New Zealand is an island off the coast of Australia if you've never been on a ship in the Tasman Sea or flown up in space to see it yourself? The fact about the world is one you can believe, um, that fact about the world is one that you can believe because you've seen it reproduced over and over and over again in maps produced by people and institutions that you trust. So this is a, a really good example, this picture um, of uh, Earthrise. Um, it was really important to a lot of people because they had never experienced, you know, um, a document that presented the world as round in quite this way before. In Bending Lines, we explore the ways that maps have bent reality and created a picture of the world that is often more real seeming than reality itself. Some of the maps in this ex exhibition are deliberately nefarious, created by people or institutions who are trying to mislead or persuade. But for many of the others, the relationship between map and truth is a little more ambiguous. Some maps dim a certain type of truth in order to let another interpretation shine through, while others classify and categorize the world in ways that should raise our skepticism. And for some of the maps here, the persuasive goal isn't trickery, but liberation, as they seek to raise awareness of truths that were previously obscured or oppressed. Instead of ranking maps on a linear spectrum with true and objective on one side and false and biased on the other, Bending Lines instead encourages you to pay attention to the social, cultural, and political context in which every act of communication is situated. Just because every map is distorted in some way or another, it doesn't mean that it's no longer possible to speak about honesty and accuracy. Um, so we need to think uh, carefully about motivations, meaning, persuasion, and presentation. Every map has a perspective, but not every perspective is as good as every other one. It may be impossible to unbend the lines, but looking at these maps, we can examine how and why they got bent. So um, one important thing to think about in this is why do we persuade with maps? Um, if we wanna get a little bit um, participatory here at this moment, um, if anyone wants to drop in the chat reasons that you might wanna persuade people with maps, uh, I would love to hear that. Um, can I look at the chat? 
while I'm screen sharing. Yes, I can. Okay. So um, why would you want to persuade people with a map? You can come up with your reasons um, in the in the chat. Funding from Penny is a really good point. Um, I want to show you this map, this bird's eye view of Boston. It's a 1902 map. Um, and this is a very popular like late 19th and sort of early 20th century um, way of looking at the world is through these bird's eye views. They're really beautiful um, in the first place. They're also um, a little bit fanciful in some ways by definition. Um, they're looking at the world from a very specific perspective that we're not necessarily used to if we're, if we're um, used to maps that are coming down straight from above. So most map makers are hoping to tell a particular story with their map. Um, when you look at this map of Boston, what story is it telling you? So I want everybody to think about like what story this map is telling. Some of our answers to why you would want to persuade is um, to get people to agree with contested borders, which I think is very true, to advertise or promote a place to tourists or new residents, which is very prescient for this presentation, to inform people is definitely true. And I think we can um, kind of expand on that, what informing people means. Are you informing them of something that you think that they should know? Um, and why, I guess, is a, is a good question to ask. So this map of Boston, um, it, it tells it that it, it tells us that it is a bird's eye view of Boston, but this is unlike most bird's eye views of Boston that we're used to because downtown Boston is way off in the distance. And right in the foreground here is this factory which um, is taking up a huge amount of space on the map. Um, you might want to do this if you were the owners of the factory, which is called um, Beach and Claridge Company of Boston, makers of, uh, quote, world famed highest standard cream of fruits, soda water flavors, unquote. In this bird's eye view, the BNC factory is up close. Um, it's bright, it's richly colored, it's huge. And it looks like the most important building in all of Boston. So buildings that are uh, other buildings like the State House, Boston Public Library are way off in the distance. There's a key at the bottom where these um, important buildings are labeled, um, but it's really tiny. And then the numbers way in the back are very tiny as well. So you can kind of see the Bunker Hill Monument up here um, in the upper right hand corner. It's really receding into the background. But the factory with its smokestack puffing away is adorned with text bragging about the company's superior product. It's on top, it has highest quality. Um, there are delivery carts standing at the ready in the yard and the train lines nearby suggest that the soda can be shipped anywhere at a moment's notice. There's also these um, kind of funny additions to the grounds of, of the factory. There's the Washington Monument here, this obelisk. There's uh, the Eiffel Tower, and there is one of the Great Pyramids of Giza. So um, they're really trying to show you their global reach, um, one that in this case is probably more aspirational than real. So I want us to all think about the fact that there is nothing strictly incorrect about this map. It just uses scale and perspective to make a very deliberate argument about what's more or less important in a way that advantages the company's marketing ambitions. So the visual language of the bird's eye view um, draws in our curiosity. It's really beautiful, um, which might make you wanna hang this on your wall. And if this happens to remind you of the best maker of soda water flavors while indulging in that curiosity and beauty, then the company did its job correctly. Um, here's a close up version of it. So you can really see the monuments here, the train line right behind the factory. Um, you can see it's kind of located on Camden Street here. 
that gives you a, a real sense of place. So even though it's a bird's eye view map um, and it's very naturalistic, the streets are labeled still, which I think is really cool. And along with the American flag, it's got these pennants, B and C Co, all over the place, including on, on the Great Pyramid of Giza. Um, the company wasn't even there for that long. We have this digital mapping tool, Atlascope, um, that takes old urban atlases of Boston, which are really huge. They're like two feet by three feet. Um, they're very cumbersome and um, they're very delicate in some cases. So what we've done is we have taken these maps, scanned them into the computer and um, layered them so that you can compare them with other years and modern day. They're mostly fire insurance and real estate atlases. So if I slide here, this is the factory in the middle in 1902. And ooh, is this working? And if I slide across to 1906, it becomes the American gauge, American steam gauge and valve works. So it goes from being this cannabis manufacturing company in 1902, it becomes Bosser um, Beach and Claridge for a very brief period of time. And then it doesn't even get a chance to appear on one of these maps. So between 1902 and 1906, this four year period, it comes and goes. So um, contrary to what you might think from this very beautiful and persuasive map that we've seen, um, it's actually not that important in Boston's grand scheme of, of industrial history. I just wanted to show you guys, um, <laughs> I just wanted to show you this um, similar map of Holyoke. Uh, this is a, an urban atlas from, uh, I can't remember what year, um, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, this is the first plate of the atlas, and this is what they look like before we kind of transform them into a, um, a map that looks more familiar to us. So there are these huge pages. Um, this one is kind of downtown Holyoke um, along the river and the canals. Um, so this is from the Library of Congress. These are really beautiful maps. Um, first and foremost, and they're also very persuasive and um, very informative. So I wanted us to look just briefly at this bird's eye view of Boston um, in 1902 compared to today's view from the same location. You can really see um, the difference um, in the heights of buildings first and foremost, I think, um, but also that that there are plenty of important buildings all over the place that really get minimized um, in the Beach and Claridge ad. So I want to take a look at this map here, which is for the proposed development of Fairbanks Park in Dedham. It, really has um, a lot going for it here, I think, as an advertisement. Um, it's very spacious, it's very open. Um, if anyone wants to comment in the chat what appeals to you about this map, where your eye is drawn, I think that um, there's a lot to look at here and it's very engaging, right? Um, so this is an advertisement um, ads are known for displaying information through a lens that brings positive attention to its product first. Um, so when the advertising medium is a map, um, it, it really creates pleasant imagery that focuses your eye on the item for sale. And here, um, the item for sale is the land itself. So yeah, Jeremy has said the grids, the clean lines really draw your eyes. And inside these grids, there are very few houses in some cases. There are these ones that are plotted out. But yeah, Cindy and Bob, they're designated open spaces. Um, and these are spaces that are being sold as house lots, $1 to $5 a week. 
Um, it's very orderly, says Kat. It's like a well-manicured lawn, which I think really strikes at, at the heart of what this is, which is a, a completely created artificial landscape. Um, I think that this is a good place to point back to the land acknowledgement that I made at the beginning and see that we are looking at this as like open uninhabited space that is ready for people to come and buy property. Um, but for thousands of years, people have lived here. So it's not really this like open naturalistic um, landscape. It is um, an inhabited place already. So back here in the background, you can see all of these larger towns seem like very far away on the horizon. We can see some Boston neighborhoods and some kind of um, external neighborhoods. There's Newton here, Auburndale, Brighton and Chestnut Hill, um, Longwood and Brookline and Jamaica Plain and Roslindale over here on the right side. So it's really suggesting this, um, you know, peaceful distance from the city, but accessibility to it. Yeah, even up here in the upper left-hand corner, it, it really hammers at home. See the accessibility, 20 minutes from Park Square Station by express trains, 100 trains a day. So that really makes you feel confident that you'll be able to get into work in the city, I think, um, but it, uh, allows you your your little piece of paradise. And then along the horizon on the other side of the map, you can see Boston, its offshoot neighborhoods, the train track leading into the city. Um, these spatial design techniques have the benefit of showing the suburb as spacious and lush as the countryside, but accessible to work opportunities in the city. And then another thing about this map is these beautiful little illustrations of the houses that we have. Um, they also have, you know, the bank, uh, the public library, I think was on the earlier slide. They're really gorgeous little illustrations and they look, again, uh, like, um, like Kat said, well manicured, um, really perfect, really landscaped already for you. So these are some reasons you might want to persuade. Um, advertising is the one that I've focused on here, but um, in our exhibition, we talk about um, inciting war, for example, is a really good uh, use of maps or a very, uh, I don't want to say good use of maps, a very useful application of maps. Um, and there are plenty of other reasons that you might want to map a location. Um, and you can check those out in our digital exhibit. But how does this happen? How do people bend lines in a way that is, um, you know, how, how do we allow this? How does it happen? Um, why does it have to happen? So um, I'm gonna show you this little clip from uh, The Impossible Map. Um, this is a, little a short film that's 10 minutes long um, that I really recommend and there's a link to it in the exhibition um, by Evelyn Lambert who is a Canadian animator and director. Um, I have to make sure that it doesn't make any noise because the noise sounds very bad as we discovered in our tech run through. Um, but basically um, there are, can you guys hear the sound? Nod heads, shake heads. No, there's basically, no um, basically the, uh, the what they've done here is they've taken a grapefruit, um, painted the globe on it, and we're looking now at the ways in which flattening the grapefruit distort and bend the lines of the earth. So here, um, Australia and uh, Asia look pretty good. Um, but then, uh, and as we draw on it, um, it looks quite good. Um, they have these celluloid pieces that they put over the grapefruit. And then if you kind of roll it back the other way, when you roll it back the other way, um, the uh, other side of the globe, 
ends up looking really good. But those parts on the east get really distorted and, and stretched out. So basically, the idea is you can't flatten the globe perfectly. You're always going to be distorting either shapes, sizes, or both. Um, and that's not ideal, right? It's very disappointing that you can't map a globe perfectly onto, um, onto a flat surface. And what that means is that we're always going to have inaccuracy in any projection. Um, so here is um, something that's in bending lines. This is um, something that I just clicked through to show everybody different kinds of projections. Um, they have some funny names. Armadillo is kind of a silly name for a projection. Um, I'm not sure uh, where it comes from. I think it has something to do with the um, kind of scales along the back of the armadillo. So you can see as I move through these that these circles change shape and change how distorted they are as we move through. Um, every different kind of projection is choosing what to preserve, um, either shapes or sizes or some combination of the two, um, and deciding what is what is the most important for the argument that you're making? So I'm going to skip ahead. To, there's some goofy ones here. Sinusoidal is a kind of goofy one. Um, the one that we're most used to is a Mercator projection of the Earth, um, which is good for um, for shapes, but not for sizes. So you've probably heard this before, but on the projection of the Earth that we're all used to, the Mercator projection, um, the, uh, the shapes at the top and the bottom are really well preserved in terms of their coastlines, but they're huge. They're way bigger than they should be. So when we see Greenland in a map like this, it looks very small, from smaller than what we're used to, but in fact, we are wrong about how big Greenland is because we're used to uh, a map that blows it up to three times its size. So I want to look at some, some examples now of work that cartographers did for our, um, our exhibition. This is um, going to be two maps done by this um, cartographer. Um, I think her name is Maggie. Um, sorry, I should know that. Um, but these are two maps made by the same cartographer using the same data um, that talk about the difference in, um, in toxicity, ideas about toxicity of cities. So this first one is called hotbeds of contamination. If you want to mention in the chat what this makes you think about, what ideas this gives you about cities, um, and how it makes you feel about cities, you can comment in there. I want to point out this like uh, oil spills, chemical leaks, construction debris, the number of release sites gets um, darker the more there are and lighter when there are fewer. So Boston really sticks out here, as does Lowell, Worcester, and Springfield. Um, New Bedford's not doing too hot either. Penny says, um, makes me concerned about one's health. I think that's um, super true. Um, Brianne points out that it doesn't reflect the differences in per capita releases. So it seems like smaller towns are very safe which I think is a really great point. Um, so this is just the number of release sites. And something that we talk about a lot in mapping um, is normalization of a map. So taking, for example, um, population into account, because if you're just looking at this map and you don't know what it's showing, you might even think that this is a population density map, right? Um, 
And it turns out that's often what you are mapping when you just show straight numbers of things. So here is a map done by the same cartographer using exactly the same data, but it's number of release sites per 1,000 people. And if you look at this map, there are small towns that really seem a lot dirtier uh, than the cities. So Coleraine, Chesterfield, Stockbridge, all of these cities that are very small um, actually have much worse um, release site per capita uh, data than the bigger cities. So Boston is kind of in the middle here in terms of the color scheme. Um, so I think that this is something really important to think about. Here's the map side by side. So you can kind of see how she took the same data, um, the same color scheme, the same layout even of her map. And um, these are maps that tell completely different stories. So this is really important to think about when we're gonna be getting a ton of election mapping coming up. Um, we're probably already being inundated with it. If you're watching the news or reading the news, there are maps everywhere right now. And it's important to think about why somebody is telling a certain story, how they're using data, and um, how they could be using data in a way that is trying to persuade you of something. Um, so they really have this power um, which we've called the power to make belief uh, in our exhibit. And one really great example of this is the um, Gleason's New Standard Map of the World. It's a very popular um, map in our collections. Um, it gets like a ton of hits from people investigating our, our collections and using our collections. Um, and the reason for that is that this is a flat earth map. So, um, Basically, what has happened here is um, this person has flattened the globe completely, starting at the North Pole, uh, using the North Pole as the center point. Um, it's uh, it says somewhere as right up here at the top, as it is in quotes. So he's really making this argument that this is how the world looks. Um, and a lot of people who believe that the earth is flat access this map and use it on their websites and all over the place um, to point out their point of view. So you can really use maps um, in any way you want. I think this is a really good example. Um, and although this maybe seems a little hyperbolic to a lot of people, a lot of our maps in our collection have the word like accurate or precise or um, say like as as it truly is in the title of the map. Um, there's a lot of maps of Boston, especially from like the 17th and 18th centuries that say like the area of Boston, um, like the most new and accurate map of Boston. Um, so people are constantly making assertions about their maps and with their maps and about their data um, that are maybe worth questioning at least a little bit. I think this one gave you quite a lot. So I wanna pivot now a little bit to maps in your neighborhood. This is um, a really great um, plan of the new city at Hadley Falls engraved expressly for the New City Weekly Times. Um, it's this really cute little map um, with uh, the few um, kind of landmarks that exist at the time. Um, there's, uh, I included the, the text of it, which I think is really great, some of this. Um, that a situation better calculated for a large and beautiful manufacturing city could not probably be found in any state in the Union. The water power is far superior to any in New England and is excelled by few in the United States. Um, it affords a bold and commanding position, but seldom found. So this is a real advertisement for Holyoke, um, which is what the city becomes. Here's an up-close version. 
So you can see the dam in the falls over here on the right. Um, these buildings marked two are boarding house blocks all along the water here or along the canal. Um, these ones over here marked three are uh, the mechanic blocks. There's the reservoir here at number four. So it's really, um, it's a well, well uh, lived in city already in, in this kind of plan, um, but they've chosen to represent it with very blank imagery. So like everything is white, everything is kind of empty and ready to be inhabited. And I took the map um, and put it all the way over the current map of Holyoke. So you can kind of see um, where that, that um, predicted or uh, what's the word they used? Um, the new city, the new city that's contemplated for the uh, area um, where that would lie. Along, along current streets. Many of these streets are the same. There are some places where I found that streets um, didn't end up looking as perfect and grid-like as the um, planners of the city probably intended, which is something that very often happens. I think something that not everybody thinks about is many maps are made as these sorts of plans, um, which means that they don't necessarily happen according to plan when you're going about uh, creating the city. Um, so there are these cities that there are like parts of Boston, for example, that are filled in with landfill, um, like Back Bay area. That area um, has all these maps that are completely inaccurate because they were planned maps of the city and they didn't end up actually looking like that. Um, so the city and the map are kind of at odds in that way. And then I wanted to look um, at these bird's eye view maps of Holyoke. Um, I've got two of them and I wanna kind of compare and contrast them. So here's this one. Um, and I want people to write in the chat um, what this makes you feel, what you would think about Holyoke if this is all you saw of it. Um, what do you notice about this map? I will say it's an 1877 map of Holyoke. Um, and you can kind of see it's looking at this really specific angle. So lots of space, room for growth. Kat says it looks like an island, which I think is really true. It looks like kind of like it's here in the middle of nowhere. The sky here looks the same as the water. Um, Bree says there are so many trees by the river, so much green space. The grid, Penny points out, is very noticeable. Not a lot of housing showing. And nice parks and open space. So I think these are all incredibly useful observations. The canals, definitely, um, are an important part of this thing because it's showing these you know, tiny little buildings that are um, barely taking up any space in this huge and spacious area. And then this is from just four years later in 1881. Um, if everyone wants to do the same thing, talk in the chat. How does this map make you feel about Holyoke? Um, what would you think about Holyoke if you saw just this map? So yeah, this one is 1881. City of Holyoke and village of South Hadley Falls, Mass looking north. So a slightly different perspective on this map. Very industrial, everyone is saying. There are these portraits of factories just all around. Um, it, it's not all flat. Um, it's very, very industrial, very busy looking. So I think these are all very true, especially compared to this kind of bucolic green uh, emptiness, this like very stark black and white industrial smoky city is very different. So if you look at them side by side, you can tell that they're the same city, I think. Um, 
and really not that much has changed in terms of like how many buildings there are. There's still a lot of empty space in the black and white one. Um, and if you really look closely in the greener one, there are little plumes of smoke coming off the factories as well. But I know that I personally didn't notice that at first when I looked at the greener, the earlier one. And I definitely noticed the smoke coming off into the river um, on the later one. So I took this um, kind of close up picture of some of these companies, the Albion Paper Company and Far Alpaca Company, which I don't know what they do. Do they, does that have, I don't know. If anybody knows what that has to do with alpacas, let me know. Um, so there's a cutlery company, there's a thread company on Main Street, textile manufacturing, that makes sense. Um, so there are all these huge manufacturing companies um, that are really setting up shop. Um, and I think that this map invites more to do that. So that is all I have in terms of my planned presentation. Um, if people wanna ask questions or have me go through um, more about Atlas Scope or more about bending lines, I'm happy to do that. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, if you wanna stop sharing your screen, we can we can um, all see each other for some question and answers if you'd like. Yeah, Great. sure. All right, I'm gonna move the spotlight so that we can see everyone. Great. Rachel, I had a quick question. What other tools do you have online that folks can use? That's a great question. So as you mentioned at the beginning, we have over 9,000 maps that are digitized. Um, so you can go onto our collections. Um, I will type our collections um I think that's the first school bus. Look at how old that house is. Look at it. <laughs> um, so collections.leventhalmap.org is where you can find our collections. They are really great. Um, they're very extensive, although I will say that um, as we talked about at the beginning, um, they are all from this like almost all from this Euro-American perspective. Um, and many of them are from government perspectives as well. So they're showing a very particular view, um, but we have a lot of maps of the American Revolution period. Um, that's one of our collections of distinction. We have these urban atlases um, and we have uh, a lot of maps of the world as well. So um, we would love for people to, to see those. Um, also, if you were interested in, in when I overlaid that map of Holyoke onto the current map, you can do that yourself, actually. There are plenty of maps that have been, it's called geo-referenced, um, but some of them haven't been, and we would love people's help to do that. So when you're on our site, um, you can always click geo-reference this map when you're looking at a map, and then you can, yourself can like put pins in the map and in today's map and line them up on top of each other. Um, Great. So we have a question in the chat from, from Jean Dempsey. What was the purpose of the insurance map? That's a great question. Yeah, um, they're specifically fire insurance atlases. So they are um, to kind of figure out what is um, at risk what is a bigger risk to insure and what is less of a risk to insure. So um, some of the things that they show because of that are like building material, um, whether something's a special hazard um, based on what kind of production they do or um, yeah, what kind of factory it is, whether they have a lot of boilers, a furnace that's running all the time. Sometimes it even says like one night watchman or something like that on the, on the building. So you can really learn a lot um, that they didn't necessarily expect people in the future to find particularly interesting, but um, was really intended at the time for being able to know what to ensure and for how much. Um, yeah, it's got a lot of great information like how many windows are on the building, what level the windows are on. Some of them are more detailed than others. 
Great, thank you. So if anybody has other questions, you can either raise your hand or put your name in the chat and I'd be happy to call on you. Um, if your camera's on, I can see you. Um, otherwise, um, you can just unmute yourself and yell it out if nobody is talking. I actually have a question, so I'm sure. gonna call on myself. Um, so for the bird's eye view maps, um, we talked about the insurance maps. Um, mm -hmm. Who would be commissioning something like the, the bird's eye view map or would that be something that the, the cartographers were trying to sell? I think that it would matter, it kind of depends. So like the bird's eye view, the very first one that we looked at, um, looked at a beach and Claridge company, um, that company definitely commission that that's like fairly obvious when you look at it <laughs> but you're right that like that's not always the case right there are these bird's eye view maps of cities that just show the city and i think in some cases the cities commission them um as kind of advertising i'm not sure if that's always the case um i'm sure that some people well, you know some map makers were interested in doing certain cities and approached the cities about it but i think that it is an effective advertising technique for getting people to move somewhere right like if you saw that like beautiful like pastoral view of Holyoke, you would definitely think like this is a good place to move my family <clears throat> excuse me and on the other side if you were a business and you saw the 1881 version of that you might think oh this is a great place it's got a falls it's got a dam it's got all these canals i can really um make something of my business here um, it's very business friendly area. Thank you. So we had a follow up question from Jean Dempsey um, about the insurance maps. Were they made by one company or shared between companies? There are a couple different companies that do them. Um, the most famous one is the Sanborn company. Um, so you'll often see like they might just be called Sanborn analysis in some places, um, but they're Sanborn fire insurance. Atlases. Um, we have a lot of Bromley atlases as well, which, um, and so some of these are, are just real estate atlases. Um, my favorite, my personal favorite uh, atlases are the GM Hopkins ones. I think those are the prettiest <laughs> from my perspective. They've got a lot of, um, a lot of detail and they often like explain they, they have a lot of the best explanations of like why a building is being shown, you know, implicit or explicitly. Um, and they have really pretty typography on them. <laughs> um, yeah, but there are a bunch of companies that do it um, or that did it. And they, these Alice's stretch from kind of the mid 19th century to through the 20th century. But a lot of the ones that are later, um, we don't have in our tool yet because of copyright law. So anything that is after, I believe, 1940, we're not able to put up yet. Um, but our maps of Boston that we have on Atlascope um, go from uh, 1861, I think is the earliest one, and 1938 is the latest. And we have all sorts of, like, they're from all over the city. Um, and as I showed you, they exist for Holyoke as well. We don't have any in our collection, but the Library of Congress does and a bunch of other libraries as well. And the, the creator of those maps that I showed you, the, the toxicity in our cities and toxicity in the countryside map, um, the cartographer is named Maggie Owens. Thank you. Um, Robert, were you raising your hand? I was, and uh, Rachel, thank you very much for a, a very nice presentation. One question on the variety of maps that you have, are they pretty much limited to Massachusetts or do you have them uh, uh, all over New England and all over the country? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I focused a lot on, on Boston and New England in this, but we do have maps from all over the country. Um, I would say that um, Boston and Massachusetts are some of our specialties, um, but we do have maps all over New England. We have some really nice maps of like Maine and New Hampshire, um, and we're always collecting more. So um, especially maps um, from the 20th century we're really interested in. Uh, 
we don't have a really strong collection for the 20th century at the moment, um, or at least not, not as it gets later in the 20th century. Um, we have quite a lot of world maps, like old world maps that show like, like those classic ones that have the two hemispheres, um, kind of uh, Orbis uh, maps. And yeah, and we have a lot of maps that aren't digitized as well. So if you're ever interested when we're back in person again, fingers crossed, um, if there's something in particular that you're interested in researching, you can always go to our website um, and request um, a research appointment. Um, so we have a GIS librarian who does um, mostly like digital data and mapping. And we have another reference librarian who is um, really an expert in our collections and can help you find exactly what it is you're looking for. So if you're looking for like genealogical data um, or if you're interested in a particular place, she can direct you where to go in our collections and she can probably also direct you where to go in other people's collections if we don't have what you're looking for. So pull a little uh, Miracle on 34th Street on you. Okay. Well, thank you. I will give that an attempt sometime. Great, yeah. And if you, if you guys ever have trouble, um, navigating our website. We're going to have a brand new website up soon that will hopefully be, you know, beautiful, very easy to navigate. But if you're ever having trouble with that, you can always email me or get to me through um, Brianne and Penny, and um, we'll be happy to shoot you in the right place. Again, thank you very much. Very nice no presentation. Problem. Thank you. All right, does anyone else have some questions? I don't want to monopolize the question and answer period. If you can, you can put your name in the chat. If you don't want to say it out loud, you can also ask your question in the chat. Um, I do have another question, though, so I am going to ask it. Um, how has the sort of switch to digital mapping, like the like Google Maps and digital GIS, how has that um, changed your role at a, a map archive. Um, I, I know that a lot of that is, is still very recent, but I imagine there are some questions about how we will maintain archives of Google Maps um, changing boundaries and new cities and things like that. Definitely. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that, I mean, having data sets is really important and Something that I think not a lot of people think about when they think about maps is that maps are just like a collection of points and lines and shapes um, that have data attached to them, that have what we call metadata. So um, a lot of people, um, a lot of archives like, like us, we are not only a home for uh, physical maps from, you know, the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, but also 21st and, and also 20th century data um, that is, you know, just in a spreadsheet or in some other kind of format that a computer can read that, um, that we can store for the future. So um, I think like your question about like how Google Maps like, I think maybe one of the things that you're hitting on is that Google Maps can kind of portray the world however it wants. And there's there's no um, like oversight or anything like that of how they show different areas of the world, especially areas with contested borders. Um, and I think keeping records of like digital records of um, of how the world is changing and how maps, um, digital maps of the world are changing is really important. Um, trying to think if there's anything else in that question that I want to hit on. Um, but yeah, I, there's like a lot more to mapping than just the end product. The, the data that you collect along the way is really important. And as we've shown, you can make a lot of different maps out of the same data. So collecting the data, storing the data, um, and having it publicly accessible are all really important parts of that. If you want to collect your own data um, about something and you want to make a map, that's also something that we help with. Um, so 
Um, we have people who are interested in making maps for books that they're writing. Um, some of them are history books. Sometimes people are writing like fictional books, like fantasy books, and they want to create maps for those and they come to us for that. Um, and yeah, I think just like having that data publicly accessible is really important. Thank you so much. All right. I just want to thank Rachel again for coming. I know some folks um, might have to pop out, um, but I'll take a couple more questions if anybody has any questions about maps. I, I think the, the um, so sorry, the presentation that she was showing us from her exhibit was so fascinating. Um, and I know that you're all going to want to take uh, a minute to go look at it on their website as well. So I just wanted to um, thank everyone for attending and I want to let you know that our next presentation will be a bilingual or primarily Spanish speaking um, presentation from our students who are Latinx majors up at Holyoke Community College. Uh, they and their professor Raul Gutierrez will be presenting on the Latin American presence in the United States. So if you can help us um, advertise that, if you know anyone who's Spanish speaking, who's looking for a presentation they could partake in, uh, help us get the word out. We'd really appreciate that. And we will, it will be in uh, bilingual. So if you're English speaking, uh, there will be someone there who will be translating as well. So um, thank you so much, Rachel, for bringing this to us. I, I can't wait to go look at the website and really dig into that exhibit. And um, yeah, your presentation was great and love seeing the maps of Holyoke. <laughs> As, hey, thank you so much for having me. It was really fun to do this, um, really fun to prepare for it and think about what, what people might be interested in. So yeah, you guys are welcome to come to the online exhibit anytime. Hopefully we will have a physical exhibit next winter, spring, sometime in February, March, April. No promises on that, but that's that's still what we're hoping for. Um, and we're doing a lot of uh, online um, uh, events like this one. So if you wanna get on our social media or get on our um, email list, um, I definitely recommend that. Great. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks. And it looks like Rachel- Thank you the link for y'all in the chat. So if you want to check out that exhibit yourself, um, it's right there. All right, any last questions for Rachel? Great, I think we're, we're gonna wrap it up. Ooh, I have one message, let's see what it says. Just thank yous from folks in the chat. So I um, think we're gonna conclude the presentation and we hope to see you either next week or at an, another presentation in the soon future, in the near future.